I'm on my last 100 miles of the Pacific Crest Trail. 10 miles to Aetna, and then 60 more miles in Northern California, and then it's to the border, to Hearts Pass, to reach the Canadian border. I really never thought it would come to this. I never thought this would happen. There were so many things that could have destroyed this trip. But now, it kind of looks like it's going to happen. Yeah.
A few days into Oregon on the Pacific Crest Trail in July of 2023, I ran into a fellow PCT hiker who I met the year before in the California desert. Christian was a Nobo, northbound hiker, and I was a Sobo, or southbound hiker. Just as we were about to part ways, I asked him about the trail ahead. His words would resonate with me during our entire trek across Oregon. He said, when you hike through Oregon, you'll be happy half the time. During part two of our PCT adventure, we would endure massive blowdowns, long patches of lava, miles of burn areas, and painful waterless stretches. But sometimes, as quickly as a shift in the wind, we would find ourselves journeying through pristine meadows, gazing upward at stunning peaks, or cooling off in a thundering waterfall. The PCT through Oregon would careen from heaven to hell, back to heaven again. One moment we were struggling through scorched valleys of death, while over the next mountain, we hiked through country that felt like we were witnessing the dawn of creation. It's July 2023, and we're back on the PCT. Only this year, we're headed south from Cascade Locks, Oregon. Our goal is to complete the sections we missed last year due to smoke and fire. All of Oregon, 150 miles of Northern California, and the last 30 miles to the Canadian border. Our sun blisters, more on that later, and our recently adopted Husky Burn are on the trail with us. After catching a ride from Seattle to Cascade Locks from a kind trail angel, we can already tell we'll have hot hiking ahead. I'm anxious to transition into that elusive state known as trail time, when you merge into the rhythm and pace of the trail. When the trail scrubs away your modern, worldly concerns and all you need is what you carry on your back and the bare essentials, food, water, and shelter. Despite the scattering of burn areas and high midday temperature, the mornings were sweet, silent, and refreshing. I'll take the Oregon mornings, 
strolling through the deep, dark forest when the dew clings to the pine needles under ancient trees, when your companions are the laughing rivers and the dancing flowers, such as the Oregon avalanche lilies, bear grass, rhododendron, alpine asters. Few things on this earth can bring peace like an Oregon morning. A few days into the trip, we took a bus from Timberline Lodge to the small town of Government Camp. We set up our tent behind the Cascade Ski Lodge, and the manager fed us and the Ravens leftovers from the morning meals. Festive people prepared to celebrate the 4th of July, but none were as jovial as the town's Ravens. I spent the morning sipping coffee and watching the Ravens. Somebody had to do it. The raven is 1% feather, 99% attitude. Irreverent and always living in the moment, ravens rarely get too worked up about anything unless food is on the line. If reincarnation is a thing, and if I have a say in my next assignment, I would like to come back as a raven. As a raven, I would enjoy tormenting picnic goers, inviting myself to family reunions, 4th of July celebrations, and even outdoor weddings. As a marauding dark night of the sky, I would raid dog food bowls, children with ice cream cones, and celebrate garbage day with the zeal of a Southern Baptist. It would be a life well spent. Heading south from Olali Lake, we were warned about the burn areas ahead that would stretch into the Mount Jefferson Wilderness area. We did the best we could to cool off and began a routine we would follow for most of the trip. Hike like crazy between 6 a.m. and noon. Take a siesta until 3 or 4 p.m. And then hike until 6 or 7 p.m., set up camp and repeat. True to Christian's words, just when we were hammered by burn and blowdown areas, we transitioned into the beautiful Mount Jefferson wilderness area. But then, a while later, we encountered blowdown madness just south of Rockpile Lake. As we hiked our way toward Santium Pass, my son's feet revealed nasty blisters and Flash twisted her ankle in a massive blowdown section that looked like a giant game of pickup sticks. For a moment, I thought we would have to push our inreach for a medevac, but Flash pulled out her long underwear and fashioned an ankle support and trudged on. When we reached camp before Santium Pass, we were exhausted and practically out of water. It was the low point of the trip I drew water from a melting snowbank on the trail and we pitched our tent in the only flat area we could find, next to old, burnt trees with fractured bases known as widowmakers. I was so tired that I ignored the danger of trees being knocked over by the wind. I prayed that if I was going to be killed by a deadfall, at least make it quick. This was our hardest day.
Ten days into our trip, we started seeing traces of the herd stampeding north. You develop a quick rapport and instant bond with other hikers, drawn together by shared eccentricity and a lack of concern for security, hygiene, and adversity. A person's age, ethnicity, sexual preference, political party, or 100 other social identifiers we humans use to define who's us and who's them are meaningless when you belong to that universal community, that melting pot of hiker trash. You also find people connected to the civilized world who help you along the way. People who loosely fit the name Trail Angels. There was Rob and Rachel who gave us water and ice at Little Lava Lake. Susan the maid at Crater Lake who stuffed three hikers, their dog, and all their gear into a Toyota Corolla. And mentioned during the drive that her car sometimes had engine surging problems. Jesus and his family who carved out some space at a campground for us when all the regular camp spots were taken. And Kitchy, who gave blisters a ride to town. While many may start the PCT a little cynical about mankind, it's rare that you end the trip feeling so. The days grew hotter, and as we made our way past Big Lake Youth Camp, our daily siesta became an essential part of our routine. The art of the siesta perfectly melds the spiritual need for rebirth with basic science. First, it's important to purify yourself through a form of hiker trash baptism in a lake, stream, waterfall, or in a pinch, a snowbank. Once cleansed, and before you commit to sinking into the dirt, it's critical to apply skills in the following sciences. First, topography. You don't want to rest your haunches on a bunch of bumps and roots or rodent holes. Having to shift your position during mid-siesta is the sign of a siesta neophyte. And so, if you want to become a siesta savant, you need to analyze potential siesta locations with the skill of a general analyzing a battlefield. Then, gastronomy. You want to make sure you have your food and water accessible as soon as hiker hunger strikes, but not too accessible or you'll invite the ants. And finally, meteorology. You want a cool, shadowy place that also has a breeze because nothing is more annoying than a mosquito horde discovering your position. A good siesta should last 30 minutes to one hour, and it should take less than 90 seconds to fall into a warm, comfortable sleep full of visions of warm beds, hot tubs, and all-you-can-eat buffets. If I had to choose my favorite siesta place, it would be along the banks of Thielson Creek. Beautiful scenery, cool, refreshing waters, and a nice breeze. Thielson was the Garden of Eden of Siesta World, a place with deep shade, flowing river, and a gentle breeze. Beyond Elks Lake, we started to hit the hiker herd and the mosquito swarms, also known as skeeters, moseys, and the more precise, technical, scientific term, shitheads. 
These mosquitoes seem particularly riled along the trail, and I imagine the leader of these buzzing bastards must have mimicked Winston Churchill's speech as they lurked alongside the trail. We will bite you along the trail. We will bite you on the beaches. We will buzz you along the camp. Up your nose, in your food, in your face. We will never surrender. I don't know how many times I grumbled, you little kamikaze shitheads. Too many for comfort. Some folks lathered in deet to the point it probably altered their chromosomes. But by the time we started seeing dragonflies, mortal enemies of the mosquito, who can eat upwards of a hundred mosquitoes a day, I treated them with all the respect of airborne knights and shining armor. Perhaps one of the most beautiful scenes was laying in a meadow near Thielson Creek as the dragonflies made short work of the mosquitoes. We prayed for windy days, frosty nights, a dragonfly cavalry, and tent zippers that would never strip. We expected Burn to be something of a burden, but the trip established her firmly as part of our family. She adored blisters, primarily because he shared his meals with her. She seemed at home on the trail, and a good roll in the snow brought her delight. The scientists might call what she did thermoregulatory behavior. I think Burn saw it as fun. She pulled Flash up the hills, adjusted to siestas like a champ, and maintained a vigilant watch over the chipmunks that tried to attack our camp at night. Flash said her focus on burn deflected any personal concerns for her own aches and pains on the trail. Burn handled blowdowns like a champ, and obstacles that would take us two minutes to cross, she dispatched in three seconds. Flash babied her, making sure she had on rubber-soled booties for the lava stretches, adequate water along the trail, and she even waxed her paws at the end of the day after checking for ticks. Byrne came to our family from a distinguished career as a lead dog and ran in the Alaska Iditarod. Her previous owner said she was most at home bossing around the boy dogs at the kennel. We kept her on a leash because she had a very high predator-prey impulse and would chase anything that moved. Her eyes beamed when she saw her first deer, and she had no fear about sinking her nose into a rodent hole or pulling flash into the woods to attack a squirrel. In honor of her position in our family, Byrne felt she deserved most favored canine sleeping status in the tent opting to sleep between Flash and me, and growling a little when I tried to push her to our feet. I have never had a dog who advocated for itself quite like Burn. She was our Princess Buttercup. We rested at Crater Lake, and Blisters promptly declared that the desire to hike the Pacific Crest Trail proved, my parents are crazy. The day before he left, we hiked around Crater Lake.
Flash and I continued on the trail with Burn. We missed our son. When he was a child, we carried him along on all our adventures, and some of his first words were, Up the mountain? By now, the most joyous part of the day always involved water, and I was especially taken by the waterfall at Hyatt Lake Dam. It looked like it could be the subject in a Claude Monet painting, the scene missing only a lady in a long gown carrying an umbrella. the temperatures grew hotter, and Flash decided to get off the trail with Burn before it became too dangerous and miserable. We enjoyed our greatest moment of luxury at Callahan's, which let us check in early. A room with a hot tub and a porch all seemed like heaven. After that, Flash would join up with me every few days in a van we purchased, and for the first time I hiked the trail alone, a la carte, solo, unescorted. I had no one to talk to but myself, and I caught myself several times having personal discussions and debates on a variety of topics, such as the best choice of a camp spot, or where the next water source would be complimented myself on my choice of camping spots, and spoke to the deer and the chipmunks along the way. Was I in danger of losing it on the trail? It was a fair question. Well, I've been chasing the sun since I was ten years old. Felt the heat rise on my skin. And I've been on the run from a dark and cold since I've been letting people in. Ooh, these limbs are swollen Ooh, as long as I am rolling And keep my feet touched down on the ground Here, take my lead If you're taking my hand Better watch what you buy and sell We've been jumping the rooftops in the tight ropes and Cause we figure that we might as well Down on the ground. 
I was a bit edgy. The 6,000-foot ascent of Sade Pass weighed heavily on my mind, mainly because I would be hiking it in some of the most intense heat of the summer. I decided to begin the climb at 3 a.m. and hope I could make as much progress up the pass before the sun hit. I found the nocturnal shift to be exhilarating. I felt like a panther hiking through the dark woods with my headlight, entranced by the weird shadows, the stream crossings, the wind whispering through the trees with the sound of my hiking shoes scraping the earth. As the morning light pierced through the trees, my fears dwindled because I realized I was now in top shape. The ascent and blowdowns were not holding me back, and I was not getting tired. Every so often the trees blocked the sun and the water was sufficient. Suddenly, five feet ahead of me, I startled a deer. I think we decided to suspend all the usual ancient animosities and notions of predator-prey relationship and just listen to each other for a change, perhaps a first in modern history. When you stare into the eyes of a deer, how can you not be calmed and transformed? A couple hours later, after a water break, I reached the top of the pass. I was elated and re-energized. My toughest obstacle was now behind me. For the first time, I thought I was going to complete the PCT. Until now, it seemed too far-fetched. With Sade Pass behind me, there was nothing, it seemed, that could stop me. The next morning I started early, feeling invincible, and I could hear an owl through the dark morning. I felt I had my wild heart at last. I awakened at Shelly Meadows and decided to push on to Etna Summit. Three miles down the trail, I failed to locate a hidden spring off the trail, and I was now down to just one half liter of water, and I didn't think it would last to Etna Summit. But luck came my way. A mile later, I came across a water seep in a rock and I fashioned a leaf to tease the water from the rock. And after 15 minutes, I filled three liters of water. I would make it to Etna Pass, where Flash and Burn were waiting for me with water to spare. I felt grateful for a small trickle of water, something I would not bother to give a second glance to during most of my life. On the final push from Etna Summit to the Parks Creek Campground, it seemed as if the walls were closing in on me. The trail was not going to let me go without a fight. Temperatures once again soared. It grew hot again during the day, but luckily I found relief in various rivers and lakes along the way. And on a day that was supposed to reach into the high 90s, the clouds appeared like a heavenly armada sent to blockade the sun. I also found other water seeps that provided cold, refreshing water. I would never take clouds or water for granted. They rescued me.
I pushed ahead, anxious to put California behind me. Fire smoke was drifting my way from the north, and I was just managing to stay ahead of it. I started feeling nostalgic during my last 20 miles to Parks Creek Campground. I remembered how in March 2022 I was plagued with self-doubt, thinking there was no way my aging, creaking, fading body could ever rouse itself to start a grand adventure. But here I was, close, ever so close to actually finishing this hike. And yet, I would not have complete closure on the PCT. Like a hiker version of Moses, I would not be able to stand on the monument and gaze into the Canadian Promised Land. After Flash met me at Parks Creek Campground, we drove for two days to Mazama, where I would catch a ride to Hearts Pass to finish the trek. But we quickly learned that Hearts Pass in Canada was smoky, and I wasn't ready to sacrifice my lungs for vain glory. And so, my trail adventure on the PCT would end. I had hiked 2,620 miles out of 2,650. I accepted the harsh truth. The trail provides but it also decides my fate. And who was I to complain about one thing that didn't work out when so many great things broke my way along the trail? From the opportunity to spend so much time with Flash, to the kindness and support I met along the way, to my renewed passion for life. A little smoke could not snuff the wildfires in my soul. And so we packed up and drove the Alaska-Canadian Highway back to Alaska and our cabin. With all the false starts, twists, detours, and unexpected grace, our PCT trip was a lot like life itself. While the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, for me, a textbook thru-hike was never meant to be. My PCT adventure was not artistic, idyllic, or elegant. It was an experience cobbled together and shaped by the raw chaos and grit of the PCT itself. It was full of fears faced and overcome, of tempers lost and tempests conquered, of shallow concerns and deep epiphanies. It was, in essence, my trip. In a word, it was perfect. A perfect reflection of life itself. In years from now, if you and I meet, and if you desire to know a little bit more about me beyond a superficial understanding, then you must know how the PCT continues to haunt me. You'll notice it by the way I tend to drift off during conversations. You'll notice it by the way I grip a hot cup of coffee in the morning. The way I am tempted to jump into a creek or lake. The way I stare at a distant peak, imagining myself dancing in the twilight. Or the way I smile when I see clouds above. Yes, the PCT has made a mess and misfit of me. It has made me socially irredeemable and economically obsolete. It has afflicted my heart and raked my soul like few experiences on this earth will ever do. Tim
be hot and 